I did a video looking at the recent Climate for Movie content in which, because I was directed to do a blow-by-blow -blow approach, I got through just the first 22 minutes. I asked you, should I do a part two? Well, most regular viewers said yes. For people who discovered the video because they'd been searching for the original that I was discussing, they generally said, nah, don't bother. Largely because the early representations of a science in the first 22 minutes of a movie didn't stand up to a huge amount of scrutiny, and that made them sad. And a little annoyed. Too bad for them, because here we are and here we go. As before, we are looking without fear nor favour simply to ask what is being claimed. Is it supported by evidence? Does that evidence stand up if it's there? And is it a reasonable, fair comment assertion, even if you don't agree with it based on that evidence? We got a zero hit rate so far. Let's dive straight into the next part. We begin with a question. But of the mild warming that has taken place in the last three to four hundred years, can any of it be attributed to human emissions of CO2? Normally, that's a highly relevant central question. In this movie, it's a slightly odd question, since I seem to remember that a whole bunch of the earlier content that I covered in the last video was arguing that there wasn't really any warming, that you could cherry-pick the England temperature record on the basis that it didn't really show any warming, or the Central Park records specifically in New York, likewise. Records show that there has been no overall change in temperature here since 1940. And where there was apparent warming, they argued, it was just the influence of the urban heat island effect. So not real global warming, just residue of all that concrete. So you might think they should make their mind up. Either your case is that it isn't warming, or that it is warming, but it's not us. It's kind of weird if you say it's both. The case, it isn't warming in any way it isn't us, kind of like the old saying, I didn't do it, and I won't do it again. But all right, the question is posed, and it's a fair question once you've accepted that, yes, the planet is warming. Can it be attributed to us? So when we look back in time, what do we find? Over almost all of the last 500 million years, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere has been far, far higher than it is now. Fact check true. Not immediately apparent why it's vaguely relevant to our current situation, but no doubt we'll get to that. CO2 is plant food. Then we get the CO2 is plant food comment. And this is sort of true. I mean, I only bulk at it not because I have any disagreement of substance, really just because I'm a bit of a pedant. I mean, we don't talk about oxygen being human food, although we can all agree that it's essential for human life. So, fine. Whether you call it food or not, yes, CO2 is essential for plant life. Fact check true. Still kind of waiting for the punchline, though, because you also have to answer the so what question. And the result of much higher levels of atmospheric CO2 in the past was a much, much greener world periods of elevated CO2 tend to be time periods of, of, of a huge biodiversity on, on the planet. As we saw last time, this is a bit misleading. Back in the Jurassic period, which is an example they gave before of the world during a higher period of CO2, marked by higher temperatures and forests teeming with life, well, actually large parts of the land were arid desert thanks to the very hot conditions. But certainly there was life teeming away in places, mostly near the poles. In fact, we're in a CO2 famine if we look over the last 550 million years. The phrase CO2 famine is plain wrong. I take a famine to be a situation where life of one sort or another is obviously suffering and at risk of immediately dying because of starvation of something essential. Now that's not happening today. It wasn't happening in pre-industrial times. We're certainly in a lower CO2 world today than we were billions of years ago, so fact-check true, I suppose. 
But I'm still not sure why that matters to what happens today. At the depths of the most recent glacial maximum, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere sank so low, all life on Earth came close to extinction. OK, let's talk about that quickly. Firstly, I'm not aware of any scientific research that supports that statement in the way that it's being made. Remember that the changes in geological history happen incredibly slowly compared to any human scale experience. And life evolves to fit the situation that it's in when it has hundreds of millions of years to do it. So the fact that at one point in history, CO2 levels had dropped over millions of years to become lower than was ideal for the plants that had existed. It's almost certainly why we now have what are called C4 plants. C3 plants are dependent on significant levels of CO2. C4 plants, which includes things like corn, they evolve to survive and thrive at much lower levels of CO2. And that's how life evolves when changes happen on geological timescales. Now, I suppose you could spend time debating that, but given that the amount of time to weather CO2 out of the atmosphere is measured in hundreds of thousands or millions of years, it's not as though at any point in human history it has been a looming and immediate danger. If it had gone down another 30 parts per million, we'd all be dead. To suggest otherwise would put you at risk of being labelled an alarmist, you might say. We would now show you a picture of CO2, but we can't because it's invisible. CO2 makes up a tiny fraction of the gases in the atmosphere, just 0.04 of a percent. It is just one of 25 different greenhouse gases, which, taken as a whole, form only one part of Earth's complex climate system. So what evidence is there that this trace gas is having any noticeable impact on the climate? That's rather quick to be into an argument about what a tiny fraction of the atmosphere CO2 makes up. A mere trace gas. Just seconds ago, we were hearing how essential it is to plant life. So if it's plentiful enough to have an important impact on plants, presumably it's plentiful enough to have an impact on the atmosphere. I mean, again... You can't have it both ways. We agree that it's essential for plants, even though you can say it's a small percentage of the atmosphere. Essential. Fortunately, nobody, but nobody, is proposing to remove it from the atmosphere in the sort of quantities that would give us any problems on that score. No scientists anywhere are saying CO2 bad, CO2 must be destroyed. Well, if they were and they had the means to do it, then yes, we could join together and persuade them that would be a really, really bad idea. But why are we discussing that here? If CO2 increases didn't raise the temperature, which over time would undermine the benefits to plants, then you could argue that more CO2 is good because it's good for plants, but it does raise the temperature and it increases the likelihood of heat waves and floods. And we've already seen that such events damage harvests. If your field gets frazzled by drought or drowned by a deluge, a bit of added CO2 in the atmosphere isn't going to save the crop. If it were true that higher levels of CO2 caused higher temperatures, we should be able to see that in Earth's climate history. Here, scientists are drilling into ancient ice cores. These cores tell us both about past temperatures and CO2 levels. Scientists have indeed found a link between temperature and CO2. The trouble is, it's the wrong way round. So it's true over the last few million years of the ice age that we're in now that CO2 and temperature are correlated, but if CO2 is the driver, it has to change first. OK, so last time I pointed to the need to smoke out unspoken assumptions that go into some of the claims. And here's another one. If CO2 is the driver, it has to change first. 
That unspoken assumption is that those crazy climate alarmists are stating that CO2 is the only thing that ever produces warming and hence is the only thing that ever drives warming throughout the whole of geological history. While no scientist I've ever seen has claimed any such thing, there are a number of factors that can cause extra warming. For example, the Earth being closer to the Sun in its elliptical orbit, something which happens on a cyclical basis known as the Milankovitch cycle. Or the removal of ice cover, meaning that you have less reflective surfaces, more of the Sun's rays therefore get absorbed and that warms the planet. It's just that looking at the evidence we have today, none of those things are correlated with what we see currently happening. Except for the increase in CO2 as a greenhouse gas. Ice ages start when carbon dioxide is at its maximum, and ice ages end when carbon dioxide is at its minimum. Yes, but that's kind of playing tricks with assumed causation, because what we're actually seeing is more in line with the standard phenomenon of reversion to the mean. As we understand the cycle, it goes like this. The Earth reaches the point in its elliptical orbit around the Sun where it's at the nearest point, and this provides some initial additional warming. Now, warmer water holds less CO2 than colder water, so the feedback to the initial warming of the planet is that the oceans start degassing and CO2 gets added to the atmosphere. That CO2 then amplifies and continues the warming until it reaches pretty much the maximum state of where it's going to be added. Remember, all of this is happening over geological, not human, timescales. Then, having reached peak warmth with peak CO2, the CO2 then is slowly but surely starting to be weathered out of the atmosphere, which starts to bring the temperatures back down again. None of that is difficult to understand or remotely in conflict with the evidence that we have. Unless you start by insisting on an unspoken proposition that CO2 is the only driver of global warming, which is why nobody claims that. While scientists have been known to use phrases like CO2 is the temperature control knob, none of those scientists, again, that I've seen, were literally arguing it was the only factor that produces warming in history. So that's all about millions and billions of years ago. What about the current day? Nor is it clear in recent times that CO2 is having any effect on temperature. Here we see industrial output of CO2 since 1750. From the mid-19th century to the mid-20th century, there was only a slight increase. It's not until the 1940s that industrial production of CO2 begins to take off. But this doesn't match the temperature record. According to rural thermometers, most of the warming in the past 200 years occurred before the 1940s. It is not true to say most of the warming occurred before the 1940s, but it's certainly true that there was a period of warming up to the 1940s, then a period of cooling to the early 70s, and then warming has taken off significantly since the late 70s there is a fair question to be asked about what was happening during that period of decline. Again, if we don't accept the unspoken presumption that no scientist is claiming that CO2 is the only factor that could ever be driving the climate, then that leaves us with an open mind to look at what are the various factors that could have been in play at the time. Now, from what I've seen, and I'm only going by the arguments being made that seem to have some evidence supporting them, because I'm open to different arguments if they have actual evidence. The other thing that happened post-World War II was, of course, the ramping up of industry, which was one of the things that produced all that CO2, and therefore a growing surge of aerosol particulates that went into the atmosphere. These are known to have a cooling effect, and the quantity being produced was certainly going into overdrive during those decades. This graph showing quantities of particulates being produced and the cooling period during that time shows a very strong correlation. Correlation, of course, does not necessarily mean causation. But since we know that aerosols have a cooling effect and we know 
and can replicate in a laboratory, that CO2 has a warming effect, the proposition is consistent with what we know about the world and about the laws of physics. You can argue against that, but not by simply ignoring it, which is what the movie does. One of the embarrassments that IPCC doesn't like to talk about was that the 1930s, when human influences were much smaller, were particularly warm. That is such a weird thing to say. It's a particularly insidious, unspoken assumption that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the body that coordinates summaries of the latest climate science, is somehow collectively embarrassed by the factual record of what happened in the past, and therefore, you know, it just doesn't really want to talk about it. Which is based on what, exactly? I mean, not the reports that the IPC produces, which talk about all the science. Again, I have seen no actual evidence that scientists are somehow in denial, glossing over the extent of climate periods in recent or distant past. But here it is anyway, being insinuated. They are trying to sell a message, and they can only do that by sweeping past this inconvenient evidence that they don't like to talk about. No examples of this being done are given. It's not even put forward as a key proposition. It's just dropped in as a little contextual statement that you might accept without even noticing that you've done so. The only science in that statement is that of how the power of suggestion can influence the way that people think about an issue by framing it with assumptions that you otherwise wouldn't necessarily have had. All right. Then we move on, and suddenly we're talking about climate models. But wait, was that really all the arguments to be made about whether human beings are causing the increase in CO2? I mean, we've had calculations done of the amount of carbon that's been combusted since the start of the Industrial Revolution, and the fact that it accords pretty well with the quantity of increases in CO2 that we've seen. We've looked at the different types of carbon isotopes in the CO2. You find increases in the one that's associated with the burning of fossil fuels that we didn't see in the records before the fossil fuel era began. And we've even checked the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, because since the combustion of fossil fuels removes oxygen as one of the component parts of CO2, and we find, yes, the levels of oxygen have been declining, as you would expect, matching the increases in CO2. Oxygen, of course, is essential for life. Again, on human timescales, not going to be an issue, but for consistency's sake, someone should be panicking about that if they're panicking about CO2. It seems to me that all of those are facts that are directly relevant to the question that they framed, but they're not being discussed or even looked at. According to computer climate models, over the past half century, rising CO2 should have led to this increase in temperature. But according to multiple satellite and balloon measurements, what actually happened was this. Now, I hear claims on this on both sides. I see peer-reviewed papers looking at the question and showing that the majority of models in the last 50 years, going right back to some of the earliest ones, have been tracking actual temperatures reasonably well. Some would say remarkably well. And I look at those graphs and they seem very persuasive. And bear in mind the methodology for those graphs is laid out in the detail of the papers and I've not seen anyone making arguments in that detail. And then the other side flatly contradict that and they say that almost no models have come close. So we then ask the question, what is the evidence base supporting that contention? And it's this graph, produced by one of the individuals most known as being an ongoing sceptic, one of the usual names. I've read the explanations as to why it uses four different unconventional approaches to graphing these figures, each of which is claimed to have the effect of accentuating the difference. I've seen no one but the campaigners defending it, but that doesn't mean it must be wrong when the disagreement's going to technical levels, I refuse to project certainty when I'm outside my own area of expertise. 
the obvious truth that everyone agrees is that the models are not perfect representations of the complex reality of the global climate. The question is whether they are still useful or whether they are worthless just because they're not perfect. Whether we can see them as broadly helpful and can look forward to them in continually improving. So far, the models have predicted warming and they have been right. Then Will Happer says this. They don't get the geographical distribution of temperatures anywhere close. They don't get El Nino, La Nina cycles. Uh, they're just nonsense. That is a huge leap and one that you don't need to be an expert to understand. There are elements of year-to-year -year variability that models don't and could never capture, which is why they have these regions of error bars. This is recognising that short-term variability can't be predicted, such as a major volcano blowing up or, indeed, an El Nino event. From that to they're just nonsense, that is a ridiculous leap of logic. I've heard some intelligent, detailed critiques of the approach to climate modelling. There is certainly debate to be had about the approaches that are taken, how they are interpreted, and particularly, of course, how scenarios are developed and how they are communicated. They can raise important and interesting issues, but they don't support the contention that warming isn't happening because climate models are worthless. It's dementing, because where we should be able to have a frank and open discussion about what's right and what's wrong and what needs to improve, this all-or-nothing extremism pushes the other side into defending models to the other extreme, not claiming that they're perfect, but to all intents and purposes as perfect as they ever need to be, which also isn't true by all accounts. So, unfortunately, a movie that could have landed a few blows on the orthodoxy around this area passes over the opportunity because it's dealing with clown caricatures. Hence why we're still half an hour into the movie, drowning in vapid generalisations. There is no truth to the idea that the Earth is warmer now than it has been in the past. It's a lie. There is no truth that CO2 is higher than it should be. That is a lie. Since nobody has asserted that the Earth is warmer now than it was in geological history, this statement is both true and irrelevant at the same time. The phrase, there is no truth that CO2 is higher than it should be, ignores the fact that it's rapid change, which is seen to be the problem, not one specific level that CO2 should be at. But if CO2 doesn't drive climate change, what does? Sorry, is this the climate change you said isn't happening? Or the climate change you said was because of the urban heat island effect? Just check. In Earth's atmosphere, there are powerful forces at work. And perhaps the most powerful of all are clouds. They simply reflect all of the sunlight back out into space. Big, bright, wide clouds. If you look at the Earth, you see lots and lots of them, and they vary dramatically from one day to the next. That is hundreds of times more powerful than the trivial effects of CO2. This is an example where two things can be true at once. Water vapour is indeed a more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2, but it's very short-lived in the atmosphere, whereas CO2 is very long-lived in the atmosphere. And if CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere, the air warms up, then the feedback of that state is that warmer air can hold more moisture, so you get more clouds than you otherwise would have. The higher moisture level, therefore, is a feedback from the higher levels of CO2, and it can't be the other way round because it'd be too short-lived. In the UK this year, many of the crops that Will Happer would suggest would be thriving with all that extra CO2, those crops have failed because of 18 months of heavy rains, just flooded and waterlogged everything. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that specifically happened because of climate change, because such things happen from time to time, as they have done throughout history, 
but it is the sort of thing that we expect to happen more often with increasing climate change. So yes, more clouds can have a climate impact in terms of warming and cooling, as well as some of the other impacts that increasing precipitation will have in some of the regions of the planet. But what controls the number and density of clouds on Earth? An exploding supernova sends out vast quantities of debris, tiny charged subatomic particles known as cosmic rays, traveling almost at the speed of light. And as they hit Earth, they develop into seeds which attract water vapor and form clouds. So the proposition here now is that clouds are formed by supernovae happening many light years away. And that has led to global warming today. That is a bold proposition. Now, there has been a genuine scientific debate around this, and there comes a point where I will step aside and simply watch those qualified proposing and opposing such ideas. But some of those debates are understandable to us humble lay people, even while some of them are not. Components of this discussion that I did note were these. First of all, there is no apparent upwards sudden trend in global cosmic rays. That does not necessarily affect the proposition that such cosmic rays may have a part to play in cloud formation. It does make it an unlikely candidate for the originator of recent global warming. Second, as we've already noted, the recent phases of global warming have seen more warming during the night than during the daytime, albeit that we've seen warming in both. That would make increased or decreased cloud cover interacting with incoming solar insulation an odd primary factor. The point of clouds is that they reflect the sun's rays back out into space, and the absence of them allows more of that radiation through. Well, you might notice that's not something that happens a great deal during the night time. Here is a proxy reconstruction of ocean temperatures over thousands of years. And here is one of solar activity over the same period. So now we have a reconstruction of ocean temperatures, the selfsame ones we ignored when we were suggesting that all modern warming was due to the urban heat island effect, but whatever. And now we're being told that, yes, there is global warming not caused by the urban heat island effect and suddenly not caused by changes in cloud cover, even though we said that it was just literally seconds ago. But instead, it's now correlated with solar activity. Astrophysicist Willie Soon decided to look again at the rural temperature record for the past 150 years. Then he looked at a record of changes in solar activity over the same period. To Dr. Soon, it was obvious that it was the sun, not CO2, that was driving temperature. I've seen graphs numerous times that seem to contradict what this slide is showing here. So that means we go to the source and see what the data shows and see what the updates show and whether what we're given here is true to what is being claimed. And we come up with this. While there was some correlation previously, the recent solar activity and the recent planetary average temperatures have diverged significantly. It's kind of hard to look at that and sustain an argument that there is a direct causal link there. Plus, if global warming was tied to increases in solar activity, the warming would be at all levels in the atmosphere. But it's not. We see a cooling stratosphere which is consistent with a greenhouse gas-led warming, not with a solar-led global warming. Why are these and other studies never reported in the mainstream media? I'm guessing that would be why. Because IPCC is determined to go on a narrative that only CO2 can drive the climate system. They turn off the sun, essentially, right? Oh, I see. They are determined to suggest again that only CO2 can drive the climate system. Note, not to suggest that only CO2 is the principal causal factor in recent warming. I mean, you could probably find actual IPCC quotes for that. No, no, that 
only CO2 can drive the climate system at all, ever. And of course, they don't provide a quote of the IPCC saying that, because as we've already noted, there isn't one. You've now had decades of putting the idea in people's heads that any time the weather's bad, it's climate change and greenhouse gases. So I think people at this point can't help themselves. If you have a heat wave, immediately everybody's thinking, oh, what have we done to the weather? There is no doubt that there are environmental activists and some of the non-activist frightened children that they have influenced who think exactly this way. So that is fair comment. People who catastrophize over every single headline event they have a lot to answer for. The people suffering heightened anxieties as a result, they have cause for complaint against those exact people. And while this is mostly activist campaigners and the occasional activist journalists, there are certainly some activist scientists in this camp as well. Now, that's not the same as saying that none of the recent extreme weather events are made worse by climate change. But it's certainly true that every year, by which I mean every year I've been alive, probably throughout human history, somewhere in the world has been enduring a difficult climate event. So yeah, suddenly lumping them all into human-caused global warming, not a sensible thing to do. What I've seen by reading the IPCC reports dealing with such extreme weather events is that we're starting to see a higher global average of certain events, such as heat waves and floods. We are either not yet or not expected ever to see increases in certain others, such as the number of hurricanes, although we do expect them to get stronger, even if no more plentiful. People also argue about wildfires, which I tend not to do on this channel, because there are numerous factors at play, including forest management practices and so on. So it's not a very good proxy indicator. Now that said, with California properties suddenly being rated as uninsurable by some companies because of recent patterns of damage, you can't argue it's not a relevant discussion point at certain issue factors even though it shouldn't be seen as a single variable issue for climate change. And in any case, with extreme weather events in general, it's the increase of such events in the future that is the main point of focus, rather than the impacts we're already seeing. US temperature records are the best in the world. Ah, the one true measure again. A reminder from last time, the climate history of the United States is not the same as the climate history of the entire world. Arguments suggesting that what happens in a very limited geographical area should be taken as a proxy for the rest of the world are always to be treated with suspicion. Because, of course, it's trivially easy just to try to find the ones that, however aberrant to a wider trend they may be, will support a particular contention. Heat waves in the US over the past century. It shows very clearly that the 1930s were far more prone to heat waves than we are today. Not only were there more heat waves in the 1930s, the heat waves then were much hotter than those of today. So then we're asked to look at heat waves in the US specifically. Of course, if you do that, you get the massive spike in the 1930s because of the Dust Bowl era, when poor farming practices amplified the local hot temperatures at the time. These were exceptional to the US in their severity, although there was hot weather elsewhere in the world. But that's why you can't choose one geographical location as the one true measure. A common mistake is to suppose that higher average temperature will mean more hot weather. But this isn't true. No, uh, wait a minute. I thought that the Central Park record showed that there weren't higher average temperatures. So, if you're accepting that there are now, even while saying this won't result in more hot weather, why did you say that there weren't in the first part? This seems to be one of the challenges of this whole discussion. There is no internal coherence to the alternative being offered in this movie. A whole bunch of things have been collected together to say that one proposition, that of human-caused climate change, is wrong. But none of them can be stitched together into an alternative view of this is what's happening instead. Oh, and 
we're back to central England. Here again is the Central England temperature record, the longest instrumental temperature record in the world. Summer temperatures over the past three to four hundred years, since the end of the Little Ice Age, have barely changed at all. It is winter temperatures that have been slightly rising. The Earth's climate has not been getting hotter, it's been getting milder. It is true that in a number of places you will see the first signs of temperature increases being warmer temperatures at night. I find that quite interesting. I'm not sure if it's a fact that on its own supports any sort of specific proposition that's coming out of this movie. But is it true anyway that summer temperatures have barely risen at all? Well, let's have a look. This map shows which areas across the world have experienced record heat over the years from 2014 to 2022. So, not including last year, which broke a number of records in dramatic fashion. 38.5% of the world experienced record heat at some point during that time. Only part of which was in the United States, mind, but most of Western and Southern Europe. Well, let's look to Southern Europe, one of the areas where we've been seeing consequences in the modern day, but have certainly gone beyond the trivial. This graph shows the percentage of days with extreme heat stress during the summer. So exactly the sort of hot events we're talking about for the whole of southern Europe. Kind of hard not to suggest that there's a significant trend there. And it's hard not to be aware of the real-world consequences of some of that, with impacts on harvests in countries like Italy and Spain. Last year that looked like this, from June to August. It's an illustration of why you don't just take what's happening in central England as your only point of reference for the entire world. Again, the main focus for extreme events is what happens in the future, but enough is clearly happening right now to see the proposition that hot temperatures are almost unchanged all over the world. Remember, that was the claim all over the world, not just in the US, not just in England, not supported by the evidence. Then we get a discussion of, yes, yeah, some of those things I've already referenced. Wildfires. Here is an estimate of global wildfires since 1900. It shows a clear decline. And here is a record of areas affected by wildfires in the US. It shows that wildfires were far, far worse in the 1930s. Now, this is junk data, unless you can separate out the different policies across deliberate land burning that was practiced in those earlier times. And that applies both ways, by the way. Those claiming that wildfires are made more common by climate change, they need to show that they're adjusting for the impact of forest management policies, ideally. So, if you go back to look at the original study that they reference here, Jia Yang et al. 2014, they, in that study, say this. Anthropogenic impacts are critical factors in determining global fire patterns since they may increase or decrease wildfire activity through grazing, clearing forests, altering ignition patterns and suppressing fires. In our study, human impact was identified as the primary factor accounting for the declining trend in global fire activity. The movie makers are well aware of that, because they are quoting that exact study, but they're not explaining the detail or the nuance because they apparently want to imply fewer forest fires because of no global warming. That's not me mind-reading them, a skill that none of us is blessed with, it's just inescapably the context in which they presented that data. How about hurricanes? The US has by far the best record of hurricane activity in the world. Ah, yes, the one true measure again. Don't trouble us with your scummy foreign hurricanes. Made in America hurricanes are the only ones we ever get out of bed for. But we already said that the IPCC doesn't suggest that the numbers of hurricanes are expected to increase. Indeed, Will Happer says this. And uh, there's been no change in their frequency. Even the IPCC admits that. Notice the framing. They admit it. It's not that they, you know, openly state it in their reports because 
It's what all the research says. No, they admit it, hinting that they really wish it wasn't that way. But, you know, they'll grudgingly accept reality, I suppose, if pushed to do so by heroic doubters and sceptics. This is the framing that you're being sold here. The IPCC says, We don't expect more hurricanes. The data shows we're not seeing more hurricanes. So why are we even talking about this? Who knows? But try to keep up because now we're suddenly on to melting ice caps. How about melting ice caps and drought? Here's a satellite record of temperature in Antarctica since the late 1970s. It shows no increase whatsoever. And we see a graph of the satellite record of temperature in Antarctica. Now, always notice when someone shows you a graph that, although it seems tangentially related to the proposition they're making, isn't actually measuring that thing. Surely, if we're talking about melting ice caps, we would look at data relating to ice, not to temperature. Now, you'd expect them to be related to some extent, but we have data for both. So, Here's a graph of Antarctica's mass variation, ice in other words, since 2002 as measured by satellite. It suggests a reduction of 141 billion metric tonnes of ice per year since 2002. In the north, Greenland is seeing around 269 metric tonnes per year decrease since 2002. Now, there may be a discussion to be had about causal effects and some of the details of those studies, but I'm not sure why you would fail to show the data that's relevant to the question you're actually raising. Since the movie has latterly admitted that the planet might just be warming, this is surely simply what you would expect to see. Then we have global drought since 1950. And here is a record of global drought since 1950. There is no observable increase at all. Apparently, there is no observable increase at all. Mind you, that's referencing a paper that was written back in 2009. In 2013, the IPCC agreed that it did not see a global trend towards increasing dryness or drought across the world at that point. By the time we got to 2019, six years later, the IPCC summary of the research states that the frequency and intensity of droughts had increased in some regions, specifically the Mediterranean, West Asia, many parts of South America, much of Africa and northeastern Asia. Not Central Park, New York, apparently, or indeed Central England. And clearly it was an emerging trend rather than a dramatic one. Looking forward, the frequency and intensity of droughts are expected to increase, particularly in the Mediterranean region and southern Africa. Now, presumably we would agree that would be a bad thing. Then we get stuff about polar bears and the Great Barrier Reef neither of which are indicators of climate change. Now, I understand why they get included in this montage of greatest hits, because as I reported in my own video on polar bears, it's one of the areas where the sceptics have some telling blows to land on the narrative of some of those on the other side. Because yes, when I make videos on these topics, I approach them with an open mind. That was one of a small number where I gave the win to the sceptics. Good for them. I mean, for now, anyway. Who knows what happens to polar bears in the future. But this movie is on the wider topic. And there's nothing causal there. You can't say human-caused global warming doesn't exist because polar bears. That takes us to minute 42 of the movie. And we're about to shift gear from the core science and start talking about some of the human and the political dynamics around the situation. And depending what they say, they may well have a lot more of substance to give in that area. Because, let's face it, some of the politics in this area is ripe for critique. We will cover the final part of the movie in a future video. And if it turns out I agree with a lot more of what it says at that point, it will be a shame 
that any valid critiques got associated with what we've covered so far. Because anything that deserves to be taken seriously won't be, so long as it's paired with what we've seen. Except, of course, by the true believers. The ones who leave comments below these videos calling me nasty names and arguing about how biased I am, all the while being wholly incapable of addressing a single argument of substance. No doubt there'll be some of those below this video as well. Which is fine. It's all good exercise of free speech. I am aware, by the way, that some social media platforms, including YouTube, have removed Climate the Movie because they don't want to be the vehicle to spread the sort of deceptive practices that we've been identifying in this video. Now, look, it's their platform, it's their call. For the record, I have always been against such censorship here, and I remain of that view today. The answer to bad speech is more speech, which is what I've tried to do in this video, and of which more to come soon.